Um, so this will be my first Zoom presentation, so bear with me <laughs> as I adjust to the quirks, as I imagine all of you have grown to do the same. Um, I love also seeing the reactions. I, you guys are like Zoom pros already. Like I just, just <laughs> complimenting everyone <laughs> for doing that really well. <laughs> um, so yeah, I am born and raised in North Carolina, moved to Richmond, um, it's been it's June of last year. Um, and kind of had one foot in, one foot out for a little bit. I was still working for um, the organization I was working with in North Carolina. So uh, it wasn't until January when I started with Richmond City Health District um, that I kind of, you know, became to really be fully footed here. Um, so um, I say that because actually data is not my normal style of presenting. It's, um, I think there's there's a lot of great uses in data. It shows often inequities and really helps us to identify quickly, um, you know, uh, those disparities and how they may experience in communities. But there's just still something about lived experience and unique experiences of individuals that can never come across through a data point. Um, but not being from Richmond and not having, you know, these intimate experiences quite yet, there is some level of like how much I have to rely on data <laughs> to really, until I can, you know, spend more time in places with people to get all of those unique experiences too. So um, this, I'm going to, let's see, share my screen, bring it up. Um, and let me know if anything is not working. I can see it. We can see. Okay. I, cool. It comes up. Okay. Is it in presentation mode now or no? No, it's, I see a no. Uh, okay. Cool. There you go. Look at you. <laughs> This is this is my I started with my uh, I so I do have a public health degree. I work at the public <laughs> health department, but I this is a lot of the work that I've done has been much more in communities, um, developing you know programs and interventions based on communities and me talking with them and like working with my farmers and like you know not a lot of it is actually like data driven evidence based um which is very public health <laughs> so that this is my full disclaimer <laughs> to my presentation so if i stumble through some of the data at any points in time do <laughs> forgive me um and you know i think using it um it like i said you know it's third parts so that are really helpful especially when you're new to an area or you're trying to look at quickly big landscapes and big pictures and things like that um, I am also going off of um, presentation Elizabeth has given previously, but trying to update it and then also bringing in a little bit of uniqueness of my own. Um, but I also, with all that said, I, if, I don't know how you guys do this, like collecting feedback or thoughts, like chiming in, I was curious what people immediately thought they may want to learn or um, what their thoughts were then when they were like, oh, I'm going to have someone from the public health department presenting on food access. Um, well, I mean, you can do it however you want to. I mean, it's all good. I mean, we got the chat yeah. open. And so if there's questions that pop through the chat, um, I can uh, just chime in with them. And, uh, or you can save them, save the questions to the end. It's your, it's your flow. You know what I mean? I can, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's however you want to do it. Um, questions throughout to break up my, the monotony of me speaking would be wonderful. So, <laughs> also just good too if you ever see something on a slide that's like, <laughs> no, 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 we should like stop, pause, and hash it out, <laughs> uh, and not, you know, I don't want anyone feeling like, what is that? I don't want, no. Um, yeah. All right. So cool. That's what's up. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I also have like my notes printed so when I'm looking down and not looking up that's just awareness full full transparency guys my notes are down here in front of me um, all right so the overview <laughs> uh, so I would I am on the chronic disease prevention team at Richmond City Health District so I would be in a lot of trouble if I didn't talk about chronic diseases and how they're impacting our society and communities um, one of them, I think, before we talked about food access in the public health space, we really talked about obesity. Um, and so I 
will start there. Obesity is not my, what I would call an area of expertise for myself. Um, I think that it's limited a lot of our work in the food system space um, and really kind of narrowing in on this one idea rather than looking at food in a very holistic approach. Um, and so, but I will go through the rise of obesity in America, um, looking at how obesity and poverty intersect and then we'll dig into Richmond City specifically through the lens of food access. Um, if we get bored at any point in time with like the first half of it, um, yeah, let's speak up and then, you know, because we can spend more time in other areas of interest for folks. All right. So chronic disease, just in case we were not aware. Um, Chronic diseases are ongoing, generally incurable illnesses or conditions such as heart disease, asthma, cancer, and diabetes. However, they can be considered preventable and manageable, uh, but it does require early detection and then some form of treatment or practices to, um, to just change up life circumstances. Um, and they're a growing impact. Unfortunately, in our uh, society, it is real. <laughs> uh, six in 10 adults have some level of a chronic disease. Um, four in 10 actually have more than two or two or more. Um, it, they're still the leading cause of death and disability uh, with seven out of 10 deaths in the U.S. coming from um, a result of kind of chronic disease and some complication from that. Um, and they are, you know, in general, disabling sometimes to movement, to ability, to for people to go on in their daily lives, um, especially if they're left undiagnosed. Uh, what this means for an individual, um, actually healthcare costs uh, can be five times higher for someone with a chronic disease or more than the average individual. Uh, and so that estimates now at about $8,000 a year, healthcare costs for a person um, with treatment of chronic disease. And if you wanted to see kind of those costs to the greater healthcare system, that's our uh, chart here in the bottom. Um, the leading costs are coming from cardiovascular conditions. And then in um, kind of following up immediately behind that would be treatment of diabetes and Alzheimer's disease. Um, I mentioned a second ago that uh, chronic diseases are often considered preventable and manageable. So the CDC estimates that if we were to uh, eliminate um, non-nutritional diets, sedentary lifestyles, and smoking, you would actually prevent 80% of heart disease and stroke, 80% of type 2 diabetes, and 40% of cancers in the U.S., um, which is often why uh, chronic diseases can um, be referred to as lifestyle diseases as well, which you might hear people talk about. That's like the new trending term for them. Uh, so obesity in America, I'm going to, this is like 30 slides that I'm gonna click through really quickly to make it like a time lapse. Um, so if at any point in time, I don't know, we needed to stop, just yeah, speak up, but um, so the key's down here at the bottom, and obviously you'll see at this point in time, there are only two shades of blue on the uh, slide, and all these other colors are to come. And so it's right now it's just ticking up by the year. Um, and this is data collected from the CDC, and actually the health department really plays a role in all the localities of helping collect this data um, and sending it back to the CDC. And I should say that this is also the obesity um, rate for adults only. So there was our quick little slide through and then here you kind of see it in these 10 year intervals. Um, so 1990 and 2000 and 2010. Um, so again, in 1990, you know, we didn't have anyone uh, with or any states that were experiencing obesity rates higher than 14%. Um, and then in 2000, that was higher than 20%, oh no, 24%. And then in 2010, we were experiencing levels of higher than 30%. Um, and this is the most recent data from 2018. Um, so now our highest is 35% in certain states. Uh, and that's kind of tracks with the overall, I mean, that's the 
you know, the estimates for overall average um, in the U.S. is like 35%. Um, so what does obesity look like in Richmond? Um, and so this is some of this data is from different years. So a little bit, it should, it ugh, has changed more than likely. Um, and I don't know why it was a lot harder to find it in newer data. Um, but so an adult obesity rate of 33.6 in Richmond compared to Virginia's state and um, state average in 2018, which was 30.4%. Um, and there are racial disparities that were seen in obesity rates, 23.6% in rich of Richmond um, obesity rates for adults is within white citizens and 36.7 is among African Americans. Um, and again, I wasn't able to find any other um, race and ethnicity obesity rates for the city specific. Um, you can find them for the state. But, um, and when you're thinking about our older youths, that's 16.5% of our high school students in Richmond are obese compared to the state average of 12.7%. Uh, and then here's a quick map for you all just to be able to see um, kind of how that breaks down geographically in the city of Richmond. And again, um, some of these things, I mean, if, if you were born and raised in Richmond, um, some of this might not be surprising just based on kind of investment, resource access, um, things like that, and how they influence um, obesity trends. Um, and so, but why? <laughs> uh, so before I dive into actually how complicated uh, I, I view and I think like most now um, public health professionals and individuals who are looking at this from a more holistic way um, view obesity as an issue in general, the like simplified version that people are going to want to tell you is that it's it's comes down to caloric intake. Um, it comes down to too many calories being consumed and like folks not exercising enough. Um, to reinforce that theory, people talk about, you know, 300, the average adult is eating 300 more calories per day now than they were in 1970. And 60% of those calories um, are what kind of are considered the non-helpful foods. So foods that are coming from processed foods like chips, white bread, and sugary cereals. There are estimates that 60% of the average adult um, caloric diet comes from these kind of foods, empty foods. Um, but <laughs> I think that um, I'm here to like very much say that it's not a personal choice problem. <laughs> it is a lot about our food environment. Uh, it's about federal policies. It's about how food has been marketed and to us as individuals, um, but also where people are like where larger entities like corporations and government are spending their money um, to promote food. Um, so I'm going to go, the next couple of slides are just some different things that I've pulled to just kind of show various factors that influence um, these food trends and uh, diet patterns and things like that. They're not a complete list, um, but just to show a little bit. Um, so food being spent away from home has increased uh, a lot over the year. That's this graph here on the left. Um, and so now the USDA estimates as well that of the money we spend on food, the average household, 54% of that is going to expenditures away from home. Um, so that could be, so and um, that is meaning food that, or money you're spending on food, prepared food already for you outside of the home to eat. Um, and so it's not thinking about like your, uh, your groceries that you're bringing home and preparing at home. Um, and then a little bit more if we're so for people are eating out more, just to again show this trend, uh, food that we eat while eating out has also changed a lot uh, over time. And so you can see on the right just how the portion sizes have changed. And so when you go into places, the default option is of these higher kind of caloric um, menu options and that you don't get, you know, a price cut often to get a smaller plate, even if it's not what you want. You're kind of just stuck with this. This is the first choice. This is the one that's promoted to you, given to you. Um, so even if you're like, but I really don't want all of that, it, it doesn't <laughs> a lot of places it doesn't matter um so i talked about our food environment uh, and a lot of that is 
um, how food is being marketed to us. Um, not, you know, and so there are the, um, kind of the standards, you know, what you would think about advertisements on billboards and stuff like that. Um, but also some of this money is being spent in ways that might be a little less noticeable. So just in your corner store, what the, which snacks are actually put like on the front aisles, they're the aisle caps. Um, so because they get the most visibility, which ones are at the front next to the cash register. Oftentimes companies are paying store owners to put those items up there because they are, it's shown that that they'll get sold more frequently and the items, I don't know if you guys recognize the items that are next to your <laughs> cash register um, and things like that. It's the, it's the junk food. It's the snack food. It's the stuff that, um, I mean, it's, our bodies are conditioned to like sweets and fatty things. They're pleasurable. It sends off all the right triggers in our brains to enjoy them and they're right there in arm's reach. Um, and so a lot of that money that's being spent it, in 2014, it was $1.28 billion spent on food marketing. Um, and so you can see that the bulk of that is savory and sweet snacks, um, followed by yogurt, cheese, fruit, nuts. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I saw some, I saw the chat box popping up, but now I don't know how to see it. Are we good or should I pause? Oh, I'm in. There's a question on the call. Uh, uh, are you aware of any health-related food programs being conducted in RPS schools? Uh, Jim, um, I do know of a couple. Um, and what I'll do, I think we'll hold this question until we get later on down the line, because this could be a tangent. Uh, <laughs> real heavy, it'll take us on a whole nother uh, thing. Cool. Um, so, uh, also there is just some kind of math involved in some of our food choice. So how many calories your dollars can buy, uh, and this is according by food groups. So, um, I, I like to think, and I think a lot of people would ag agree as food advocates that it is cheaper to purchase whole goods from the grocery store, go home, prepare them at your home. Um, you know, you also know exactly what's going into your food that way. And it's very difficult for families to recreate the level of um, kind of the unhealthful ingredients in home as it is in like processed foods in other places. Um, so in general, you know, when able cooking at home is typically a healthier choice. Um, but there are just some like hard realities in, so in this right here, we see that fruits and vegetables are, you know, similar calorie or similar cost to eggs, but eggs have three times the amount of calories than fruits and vegetables. So if you wanted to get as full as you would eating two eggs, you'd have to purchase six times as many fruits and vegetables um, which at, if they're seen around the same cost, then you're just spending six times more money um, to kind of get that same sort of level of fullness. Um, so that is just going to influence, you know, when a, someone is looking at their food budget, stretching their dollar and things like that. We, you know, we just heard the, I like the story about spaghetti. I, I, feel, I feel you too. Um, we had a very set routine of when spaghetti was served in the home, but it does, it stretches farther. It, it fills kids up, it fills families up, um, and it can be cheaper than the alternatives. And so, um, again, thinking about dollars and what we can spend on food, um, it, would not be at all a surprise for someone to say a lower income family spends less money on food than a higher income family. Um, but the kind of nuance about that as well is like when it represent how much it represents of the overall available budget of that family. So um, in this particular graph here from USDA, uh, the lowest in the lowest kind of quintile of families, um, spending $4,000 on their food budget annually, but that represents 35% of their overall available budget. Um, whereas the highest earners were spending about $14,000 on food annually, and that actually only represents like 8% of their budget. Um, so not only are they, do they have the capacity to spend more on food, but they also still have a lot more money left over to prioritize other needs that they may have. Um, so I think, you know, 
when folks were really focusing more on obesity and things um, in the research and focusing this in public health initiatives, people really wanted to try and pinpoint and say poverty like leads to obesity. But that's why uh, low income folks can't are like it, trends will show that they're more obese in that but that's actually not the case. Uh, it becomes a lot more complicated than that. So for the most part, um, and so it varies a lot by not only sex, but also race and ethnicity. Um, but so on the left, we see women um, specifically, and it, it does trend kind of similarly that lower income women will have higher rates of obesity. But then when you look on the right side of the image the, for men, uh, it's actually the middle income men, men that fall in the middle income bracket, um, they experience obesity at higher rates than the low income and the higher income men earners actually experience about the same. And so that's what the um, little point here is circled with the yellow circle. So oh, uh, I think that a lot of the the kind of the influencers to obesity um, in my mind is trying to get at it from a more holistic, comprehensive way, which actually starts to think more about food access. Um, and I think you know this is what brought us public health individuals to thinking about food access in a really different way, um, and so also expanding what that definition means um, and kind of really trying to figure out all the pieces of it because it is a big puzzle. Um, so now for the most part, a lot of people will talk about, you know, availability of true, you know, the availability of these, of high quality nutritional items in your local grocery store, your corner store, wherever you buy food. Um, but also the affordability of those items. You know, they may be close, but can you actually afford them? Um, the knowledge and the skills, uh, products that may be closest to you may not be ones that you're familiar with. And so do you know how to prepare them when you get them back at home, how to keep them in the fridge appropriately or, you know, in the dark spaces? Um, I think it's taken me a very long time in my adult life to know where to keep my <laughs> produce so it doesn't spoil um, in the best ways possible. And then ease of access as well. And so um, often people talk about, you know, they really talk about geographical proximity to food, um, but we are learning more and more as we kind of drop in grocery stores and areas that people do, you know, you create patterns and you create survival um, mechanisms. When, so when your grocery store does leave, you figure out a way to get the 10, 15 minute drive to the other, the only grocery store closest to you because you have to. Um, so sometimes just bringing in a grocery store to the areas that haven't had one um, isn't always the best fix, especially if it doesn't, you know, meet some of these other three um, criteria in food access. Um, and so it just becomes a little bit more complicated. Yep. Oh, you're on mute, Duran. You're still on mute, or at least I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, yeah. He says, uh, he says uh, his ancestors were smaller, shorter, and slimmer than the next few generations after immigration to America. Is it true that diet changes post-World War II made people larger in general, taller, heavier, for instance? He says, I'm probably descend from a lot of technically obese people, but the last 50 years of our family have gotten so much bigger. Mm. Um, so there's a, there's a like well-known marker around post-World War II where we became really into efficiency. Um, and so that is where, you know, sliced bread became a thing. Um, it, it was easier to make the right consistency of bread because they bleached the flour to make it so that it, you know, made this airy thing that everyone knew was Wonder Bread. Um, and so that's where canned goods really kind of blew up in like mass production of canning, not like home canning that everyone survived on um, before that time. Um, so yes, I do think that there are in general, and that was kind of, we saw a little bit of that in the obesity trends. Um, I do think there's a, a large influence um, in the way, you know, again, highly processed foods, the additives that you don't really see or kind of think about that 
are just in those kind of foods. Um, that's my non-official science statement on that, but I'd say it with confidence. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, what, like, you know, in general folks are, this is actually from 2002, so kind of impressive and it's sort of like, where was the rest of the world catching up in like common thought about food access? Um, it, I think there was like a point of derailing and people kind of forgot about these things and then we came back to them later. Um, but so you see here that the social and economic determinants um, or of being able to access food, employment, income, education, housing, area of residence, social inclusion, because uh, as we talked about earlier, there is a lot of social and cultural influence to our food and how we interact with it. Um, and then access to food. So those are some of the tangible things I just mentioned, storage facilities, preparation, cooking facilities, time and mobility, knowledge skills, um, and things like that. So more maps that I will talk through <laughs> in great detail. Uh, and these are <laughs> screenshots from USDA. So um, if you're, if you like maps, um, I do think it's really fun to play with. I wish this, preparing for this really made me wish I like knew how to use mapping software like GIS and now it's on my bucket list to figure it out. Cause sometimes you really just want a certain thing and you can't find it on what's available. Um, so on the left, let me find my notes to make sure that I'm getting this right. Yeah, so USDA um, still operates on kind of one of the more traditional, um, so we've, actually, I don't know, if, um, I think they still use the term food, food desert. So um, in general, people are kind of moving away from the term food desert because in reality, it's not a desert of food. There's a lot of food options, but it is um, very select food options that have been decided upon by kind of external forces. So people talk about it and said, you know, it's like food apartheid. Um, and so, um, but the USDA does still operate really just thinking from kind of the basic principles of income, geographical proximity to food, and then um, access to transportation. So the one on the left, um, the areas in orange, let me get, to get this right. Um, so everywhere shaded in are, would be considered low income areas, uh, census tracts in Richmond. And then the areas in orange are within a half mile of a grocery store and the areas in green are within a mile of a grocery store. Um, so again, you know, that doesn't immediately like strike any individual really is like, that's not that far away right? Half a mile and a mile. But then if you look at the map on the right, this overlay extra layer, so everything that kind of comes out in sort of a greenish yellowish tone, these are the same areas but with the additive of these individuals, the majority of individuals in these census tracts don't have access to a vehicle. So when they want to get to that grocery store that's a half mile away or a mile away, that means they have to rely either on a friend, on public transit, on ride sharing, um, and different things like that. So it just becomes an additional barrier to be able to access, and these are considered full service grocery stores. Uh, so this next map, um, so this one is a little bit different and I'll again talk through it and um, if we need, to, this one's good. I, there's a, the last map I have gets a little blurry so I might have to like try and zoom in for folks, but um, so this one right here, we have the addition of um, census tracts and the proportion of people that are receiving SNAP benefits. So again, I like to kind of, we're thinking about access in a lot of different ways. We really want to think about, you know, all of the factors that need to be um, considered when you're thinking about how folks get food and how they may primarily pay for their food. Um, so the darker the color shaded here means the higher constant, uh, the higher proportion of folks that are using their SNAP benefits. Um, and then the areas that have the kind of shaded lines on them are those areas we just saw on the other map, the ones considered to be uh, low food access areas. Uh, the white icons are grocery stores. And then the red lines are the um, one mile radius buffer for that access. Um, so I'll just 
let it sit here for a second so that folks can kind of look at it and, um, you know, you will notice uh, <laughs> that, so an indicator of not using your SNAP benefits typically, or not having and utilizing SNAP benefits typically means higher income. Um, and that seems to be where a pretty high concentration of grocery stores is. There, are, there of course are some in the South side and things like in the East End. Um, but if you're still thinking about the overall number of these grocery stores, where are they most kind of like concentrated? And it's in these um, higher, considered higher income areas. I'm going to go to the next one, but if we have more questions. Um, so this one is a little bit different. So we've not, now our colors are not representing um, SNAP benefits, but they're instead, they're representing race by census tract. So blue is our uh, census tract that's a Hispanic majority. Um, green is a census tract that's a black majority. And then Yellow is the white majority census track, and this is coming from 20, uh, it says 20, this is 2016 census, but it's got to be 2010 uh, census. I think it must be the lines from 2016, but it'll be race that's reported from the 2010 census. Um, so, we, you know, we saw those grocery store icons, and they're still here, so you still see the white grocery store icons, um, and it just so happens that you know, the majority of those grocery stores are concentrated in white majority areas in Richmond. Um, and then you have the, just to hear the orange and the blue dots, the orange ones represent other kind of convenience stores and see stores and things. Um, and the blue are your fast food restaurants. Um, and then you still have that kind of shaded overlay of the low food access areas. And then our last map, which actually, I mean, maybe it's, you guys can see this, um, but if we need to zoom in, let me know. Um, so back to that kind of point I made earlier about knowledge and skills, there are still um, households that may not have complete kitchens. Um, so now our shaded area here is uh, yellow. Um, so the darker the color, the higher per percentage of houses that don't have complete kitchens. Um, and so a complete kitchen is one that has cooking facilities, refrigerator, and a sink with piped water. Um, so that would be what would be considered a complete kitchen. So you can see here that there are still pockets um, of folks that, you know, even if they are close to a grocery store, um, they may not have that access to a kitchen to prepare everything that they could find in that grocery store. Um, and our red buffer, our red line still shows us the one mile radius of the store. And then the other squiggles and <laughs> other shading is actually, um, it is instead looking at the percentage of uh, ch uh, child poverty. So children living in homes that are considered uh, low income and, po and um, poverty line homes. And so I won't talk through that one in great detail, but um, And then I really wanted to end on like a note of this is these are a lot of like kind of you know terrible maps but it, it's not to at all downplay the work that's being done by organizations in Richmond uh, there are a lot of folks and this is not even all of them and again like I'm sorry if one of your organizations is uh, on you know doing this work and I don't know it yet so we should meet after this so that I can know it um, but so I just threw up some that I know of um, and have got to work with so far. And just to kind of, again, highlight the work of people in, they're really targeting a lot of different aspects of this food access question. You know, some people are doing education, some people are providing the space to grow healthy food, um, and some people are organizing around policies to ensure that these things, the changes that we want to see and communities want to see, can make it happen and establish it long term. So that's all I have. I hope that's okay. <laughs> uh, Dry, you're on mute. <laughs> that was amazing. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Boring <Good job>. data. <laughs> nice. Um, so yeah, yo, yo, yo. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit. Uh, uh, any anybody has any questions right uh, off the top? 
because if not, I um I can share um uh, a little bit uh to like on the food justice side of the dialogue um and talk a little bit about what that means um as far as the work is considered um but yeah questions thoughts okay all right well check this give me one but second we got, a, we got a raising hand okay what you got <laughs> i don't know I, I, well, how do you how do you see the raising hands well, I was just oh, looking in the window. <laughs> oh, okay. I couldn't see it. Sorry. <laughs> um, my question is about uh, grocery stores and um, like l large grocery store supermarkets. Um, is there any relationship? Is there any part of like federal or state or even local policy that drives where they are placed, or is it completely? private market-based the company oh, i love that you asked this question uh, <laughs> um so i mean there is some component of markets but there is also you know city incentives um and so there are incentive economic development incentives are kind of really the traditional ones that are given to grocery stores to locate in places they're usually tied to like rent or taxes deter like defer taxes and things like that um and they're the, if cities do it really well, they'll link it to community benefits also. So like certain number of living wage jobs being um, offered in that grocery store or um, a certain proportion of employees that have health benefits, things like that. Um, and you'll, I mean, there are, you know, cooperative grocery stores that don't follow necessarily this somewhat, I mean, to some extent, all kind of grocery stores for the most part have followed some level of market um like strategy and the potential and growth but um there's an example it's the only one i know of in the u.s it's in florida a uh, city government actually took over ownership of a grocery store that was going to close and they said this is a public service that we have to offer and they repurposed and retrained some of their staff that were only seasonal to give them full-time jobs year-round and now they work in the grocery store that is owned by the city mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. there are strategies out there um there's another the question is um what uh, um could you share it for oh, okay hold up what what would you be willing to share with folks about the Feed the Culture initiative. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, so Feed the Culture is, it is wrapped up, we have a final report, um, but we've hit back, you know, we've not been able to do anything with that because of currently where we are. Um, so Feed the Culture um, and, the cult and Richmond Food Justice Alliance, they really wanna go back to the trained cultivators, which I don't know if some of you may be, um, cause that was before my time. Um, but want to take it back to them and then you know determine best ways to disseminate that report and things like that but um so over the course of last year they spent well in 2018 they really designed a tool to engage communities to collect you know information but also policy pri like priorities that community residents had as it relates to how they access food um, and so, and some of that was related in schools, some of that was related in gardens and growing spaces, and some of that was grocery retail incentives and stuff like that. But it was an initiative, you know, designed by community, led and collected through community, um, and with the intention that they will, you know, push and drive local policy change that they want to see in Richmond. Um. And another, the next question was, um, what does uh, what does the work that you do with city and residents at uh, VDH? Yeah, so um, I came on. So again, I'm with their chronic disease prevention team, but I'm doing food system work specifically. Um, and so, I a little what that looks like is working with Richmond Public Schools and a school nutrition work group that's been going on for over three years, trying to. Um, you know, influence the way kids eat, encourage um, healthier items, but also local items, really try to incorporate farm to school and things like that. Uh, the Healthy Corner Store Initiative that's been in Richmond since like 2014. Um, so we 
have partner with Shalom still in that program. And so I work with Casey over at Shalom on that. Um, and then so just really being that kind of point person for the, at the health department for the Alliance, Richmond Food Justice Alliance, and working closely with them as they move into that next phase of thinking through their grassroots uh, policy organizing strategies. So I support them in that. And whatever else I end up stumbling in. <laughs> All right, and then the last question was, um, what potential policy changes uh, in Richmond could we implement or are being looked at to be implemented to increase food access? Yeah. Um, hmm. the, the thing, so, I mean, most of what I currently know that it's being like considered and thought about would be stuff that has come out of the feed the culture work. Um, some of that isn't even, doesn't require like a city council vote. Um, some of it is actually related to like implementation of current programs. So Kate, I was super excited to hear about the garden coordinator because that was actually a priority um, that really rose to the top and um, community responses is just, you know, a lot of people don't know the growing, like what are the procedures for the growing spaces? Um, what areas are actually zoned uh, by right use to grow food and things like that. So some of it isn't even, um, you know, legislation that needs to be passed or ordinances that need to be um, changed. It's some of it is purely like we just need to get information out, get it out in a clearer way, a way that's more easy for people to, you know, understand what it means. Um, and so and working with like our parks and recreation departments and schools our school system to make those changes. Um, I'm not sure of any, I know that the city has had multiple task force and iterations of task force to look at food access in Richmond. Uh, and so to my knowledge right now, there's none being kind of pursued from that report. So I'm gonna I'm a chime in real quick on that, just um, in terms of um, what I've, what, what's been going on over the last two, three months on the city side. Um, with the feed the culture that was happening on on one side, but mm -hmm. on um, the side of like beautiful RVA and really like connecting the dots, uh, we put we put put forth five different policy recommendations nice. to the mayor's office specifically about urban agriculture, um, probably like two three months ago, and um, we've been working with um, Daniel Wagner, Andreas Addison's aide on getting that push forward. Also working with Parks and Recreation to get some of those policies yeah. up. So it's really cool. simple stuff. Stuff yeah. like, you know, a rigorous reevaluation of the community garden programs, um, uh, guidelines, uh, categorizations of different types of urban agriculture, including commercial urban agriculture, the allowance of people mm -hmm. to sell produce yes. from community <laughs> gardens. Uh, water access uh, for uh, city garden spaces. So, you know, just like really rudimentary things to really create more catalyzation of, of, of urban, uh, ur urban uh, ag in the city. So from what That's I understand, awesome. they say that this stuff is moving. <laughs> I, you know what I mean? I, yeah, yeah. But I trust, <laughs> you know, there's some good people in the room on that. And we, uh, we rattled the chains a bit at Parks and Rec over the last six months. So I think um <laughs> I think they're gonna uh I think they're gonna move because that's uh, awesome. We were able to get a, a, a couple of uh uh meetings with uh Chris Felke uh and um the mayor's office was on top of it. Like so yo I, I I'm gonna send that to you so you can see that cool, yeah. everybody so they can see what yeah. we've been proposing. Thanks. That's awesome. And um it sounds like so I forgot that we did also make recommendations to the Richmond 300, like, you know, the master plan that's coming up for approval and um, vote. And so it sounds like actually some of the edits that we made align with what you're pushing to at the city as well, Duran. So that's awesome. Got a couple more questions. I'm going to throw some more in there. Okay. Jim, Jim says, are you aware of changes, improvement of food options, choices in city schools? 
I am aware of various uh, initiatives and um, kind of pilot projects and things like that that have been done at the schools um, and are being considered again, which, you know, now everything is being considered again in like months. Um, but um, we were in talks about reintroducing the salad bars uh, that have been kind of used sometimes in some schools, um, but really trying to roll them out again in phases in, you know, elementary and middle schools and high schools. Um, that is one piece of that. And then there's kind of where the next way we're actually looking is engaging parents a little bit more in this conversation around school food um, and bringing in a little bit more voice from students specifically because when you have people that sit on a work group from, you know, the health district and American Heart Association, and they're all telling you to like, we got to change, we got to do this to our food, but we're not the ones eating it. So um, we've been trying to instead engage a lot more with students and parents and the teachers in that conversation too. Um, and then the, there's a farm to school pilot uh, that Jaron's familiar with as well that, so in looking at, um, again, just incorporating a little bit more of the kind of education awareness of foods and how they're grown and trying to encourage that too into diet. Yeah, but you know, I'm going to chime in and just say we could just take a note and see how precarious, you know, it is for even school food with the pandemic, with schools being closed. I mean, even if school food was healthy as hell, schools are closed. So now kids are relying on food distro, you know what I mean? Or, you know, whatever Jason Cameras has come up with in terms of that system to, 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 yeah. to food. So it's, it's, it's really, yeah, sobering. Yeah. yeah. And, and all the nutrition guidelines um, essentially are irrelevant right now um, because of the state of emergency. So there's a lot more relaxed standards of what you can distribute right now. Hey, Yo, can I chime in with a story? Sure, yeah, go ahead. Related to food. Um, again, 20 years ago, I worked for a nonprofit in Petersburg, Virginia. Uh, we worked with young adults, 16 to 24 years old, uh, predominantly African American, exclusively African American. And one of the most significant and profound things we ever did was we started a breakfast program. And again, corner stores where we were, you know. High fructose corn syrup with food coloring, potato wedges, you know, mm -hmm. chicken wings, cold chicken wings. That's what kids are getting coming to eat. And right. these are young, growing bodies. Again, 16 to 24 years old. We're working outside. And the people I work for, a husband and wife, Methodist ministers, got some grant money. But we started paying a couple of our uh, graduates to start fixing breakfast. And we had cereal. We had bagels. We had scrambled eggs. We had sauce. We had bacon. And at so many levels, the smelling the food when you got into the room, sitting down as a group and sharing a meal together to start the day. Just the attitude uh, of the young people, of the, the people in the program. Recidivism went down, people were coming for food. Again, when you have good food in your stomach, you can concentrate. You, you can do better in the classroom. There was less, you know, behavioral issues because people are calm, they're well fed, they're processing and, you know, digesting this good food. And then on the workplace, you know, we just had, just generally speaking, and so with a relatively small group, about 24 people, uh, male and female, half and half, one group would be in the classroom and one group would be on a job site. It was amazing from start to finish to see the whole process of eating food and enjoying food together with a group of people over 30 or 45 minutes, taking time to actually eat the food, and then to see firsthand the positive benefits of having nutritious food in your body and all of those things. So I've seen that firsthand um, at some level with a group, but I just, it, it speaks to so many things that people have to have decent food. Um, it's, again, it's almost like healthcare. It's like a necessity. Uh, it should be a right that everybody has yeah. the right to good food. Yeah. And I do know the schools have tried doing uh, breakfast in the classroom again to just try and encourage that and you know have everyone has a chance to get the food especially in so in Richmond 100% uh, of breakfast and lunch is free for anyone um, 
And so there's no difference in how food is given to a student. Um, but the, that part is time, enough time in the day. So the, even if, you know, all the nutrition staff are on board, teachers are on board, they do still just have to balance out the limited time that they're given in a day and to test on that instruction. So um, we have to work on policy to, you know, fix that. <laughs> and that's not my expertise this school day, uh, but working with some good folks that know a lot more about it. Um, there's another question on here about the 2010 census. Uh, does the census sway grow corporate grocers to areas that have changed in population? For instance, Northside had a lot of abandoned homes and now there are many renovations occurring and many homes are no longer vacant. I guess she's saying like because there were vacancies, maybe groceries weren't trying to come into this area. So does the census have anything to do with that? Uh, the, it may, there's a lot, there's a lot of other data that's collected sometimes in a more frequent way, um, that, you know, grocery stores will rely on to use, um, especially for like market analysis and things like that. So, um, the census can influ influence it to some extent, but usually people are trying to supplement with, um, more frequent data. I will say this, um, to be perfectly honest, I think, um, grocery stores uh, are very subjective in their decision making it has mm. nothing to do with the market analysis mm. um, it's really based off of their own like whim of what they want to do where you know what i mean um, they, we we like to think that there's like no racism involved or no yeah. but it i mean it to be candid mm. across the country mm -hmm. You know, they say that it's because of population density and grocery stores don't make high margins and profits and all yeah. that kind of stuff. But yet, we can go to Carytown and there's four grocery stores and one square block. So, yeah. I mean, they're battling for money in that little square. So, you know, let's really be critical in our analysis of mm -hmm. how corporate operates. It's, it's really, they, they do what they want. I mean, if they, yeah. could, put, if they could put a, if they could plop a Publix on a corner where there's a fresh market, uh, what a Kroger and an Elwood Thompson's, yeah, and invest all that money to build it out. You know, you trying to tell me that they couldn't put one in Northside? I don't believe that. I think it's yeah. just because they, you know, they're trying to go for the highest amount of money, and they just don't see the the pores. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. As a as a as a uh, as a financial windfall for themselves. And then, yeah. you know, if we rely on that analysis as well, then that gets into classism. We're only like, then the grocery stores are only going to go where there, where there are people with middle right. class funding and it leaves yeah. out to everybody else. So um, a couple more questions on here. Um, hold on. Whoa, wait, man. Couple shit. Y'all going nuts. This is amazing. Okay. So, um, all right, hold on. Let me do this. All right. So we got seven more questions and they're getting really good. Um, Okay, uh, are they going to turn the city city owned diamond property off Arthur Ashe for urban ag operation? I haven't heard Ooh. shit about that. That sounds amazing. <laughs> but that, uh, I haven't heard nothing That's about that. That's very unofficial. That's just something that I think they should turn over the keys to Duran and let the. You know, <laughs> let totally with there you that. Go. Shit. Yeah, I'm totally <laughs> about that. Like, um, what is the Healthy Corner Store Initiative? Uh, who's in charge of RPS meal distribution during closing? Is it cafeteria staff? Um, yeah, those are um, some of the ones. But what I'm going to do, we're going to put these real quick. Um, Hannah, I appreciate it. You can stay on the call. I'm going to do a talk. I'm going to do, I'm going to share my screen and do my, do the talk, one of the talks that I usually do about uh, healthy food uh, sure. in, the, in the work of racial equity and put that and frame it in that lens real quick. I would love if you could stay on and see. Uh, and uh, chime in on the discussion as we continue. I'm, this is gonna take. This is gonna be quick, right? Um, I'm trying to do it in like 30 minutes, and then we're gonna get into more discussion and questions. Maybe some of the things I have to say will help um, also frame some additional questions for this discourse. All right, so give me a second. Uh, 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 while I share my screen okay boom share can y'all see my screen now can you all see it it's okay all right uh view 
I'm gonna try to full screen this thing. Uh, okay, that's all I did. That's good, man. <laughs> all right, yeah. So, okay, I done this talk. I did this talk a bunch of places. Um, let me see. I probably I don't know which one I want to do. I just got laid off from Lewis Ginner. I don't know if I want to do anything that was like Lewis Ginner related. <laughs> ah. <laughs> I just can I be honest with y'all? Like shit, I don't want nothing that that. Okay, all right. All right, so um fuck it. So I'm coming at this from a frame of food production as a tool for increasing healthy food access, right? Um, but I'm also talking about this from a frame of uh, farming and agriculture being a space that can develop local food systems uh, for communities, right? So this, uh, just a little disclaimer, this, this is gonna go food system centric real quick, all right? So um, I don't know if you know a lot about my backstory, but I've, I've been doing this work since like 2008 in the city as far as healthy food access i came into it because of farmers and i started doing pop-up markets and i started working with nonprofits and then started my own gardens and you know it just kind of been a uh you know ever evolving thing right um but we started um with the pop-up farmers markets and doing them in areas designated as food deserts when i first got um with a, for a non-profit it was Re renew richmond me and my homie john and we worked on a one acre, we developed a one acre farm on South Side called Jerusalem Connection. It's no longer there. It was demolished. The, the owner of the property wanted to build a bingo hall or expand a bingo hall over there. So, but this is a picture of said uh, uh, Jerusalem Connection. Uh, we had high tunnels and a whole bunch of stuff. So on here, I, I, this is just to frame it. There's different types of urban agriculture and what we've been focusing on or what we've dealt with a lot has been traditional outdoor urban agriculture, you know, that allows for stewardship, ecological stewardship, community beautification, and food production, you know. So it's a three, what we call, what I call a three-pronged uh, impact approach where we're dealing with the environment, uh, uh, helping enhance people's sense of place, and increasing food into the local food system. But that's not it, you know. There's also controlled environment agriculture, vertical indoor lo local food production. It's what I did at Virginia State University. It's a picture with me and Will Allen. I'm very proud of it. Uh, Will Allen, one of the pioneers of this urban ag stuff. But uh, indoor farming allows for the remediation of vacant buildings, right? So not only do we have vacant lots in cities, um, and I'll show you a graph in a few, uh, hopefully, I think at the end of this presentation that, that gives you an idea of how uh, much vacant property there is in a city. Uh, you can take over vacant buildings in addition to those vacant lots. Uh, what we did in Petersburg is we took a, a YMCA and transform an old YMCA and transformed it into an indoor farm. So we gutted it and um, put in hydroponics, aquaponics, uh, aeroponics, uh, solar power on the roof. Uh, commercial kitchen in the back, dock doors, um, you know, just a full on space uh, to help mitigate uh, food access issues and also hire people from community. But when, um, when we talk about urban ag and food access, um, I feel like it's super important uh, to have a conversation about racial equity because the communities that we are often talking about that don't have access to healthy food are predominantly communities of color, right? So in our first talk, you know, session where we, you know, uh, did the talk of John Meeser and the concentrated poverty stuff, uh, we uh, talked about redlining, right? And um, the, the, the redlining conversation, um, was one where you saw the maps of where poverty is in the city. You saw the maps of where redlining happened in the city. And those same maps, if I overlaid food access, which I'll do in a second, you could see how 
disproportionately the, the, the black and brown communities in the city of Richmond are affected by this stuff, right? And it's all rooted back into these historical inequities. So that's why when we talk about grocery stores and where they place their storefronts, you know, where it's, that is very subjective and it's very racist, you know, to be honest, uh, it, it, because it's like, it's not like they are a lack of grocery stores in white communities. You know what I'm saying in the city, and it's because of wealth, and it's because of, you know, just the way the city has been carved out because of these racist policies. But this slide here, uh, what I'm going to go through is like six steps uh, that we use to uh, approach this work through a racial equity lens. Uh, and uh, this first slide is 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 important because it's it's super important for anybody that we're that's doing this work to establish a baseline understanding of what is racial equity, right? Some folks think racial equality and racial equity are interchangeable terms, and they're not. They're not. Racial equity is a different conversation than racial equality. In fact, I would even, I would even uh, be courageous enough to say that we can't have racial equality if we haven't done the work of building racial equity. And it might sound crazy, but look at the slide. So on the slide, when we talk equity, we're talking about supporting communities according to the needs that they have and the deficits that they have acclimated as a result of living in a racist society, right? So in this, in this tree situation, you know, if we were dealing with an equal, equal situation, everyone would get the same box. But just because everybody gets the same box does not mean that everybody has equal opportunity, right? Or equitable opportunity to get, you know, the bounty from the trees, right? So here, when we talk equity, like because of the ish that has happened to communities of color, they need more boxes in order to access the fruit that's on the tree. You know what I mean? Like if you talk about like slavery, Jim Pro you know, segregation, you know, subprime lending, redlining, like that has created a chasm in terms of access to opportunity for communities of color, right? So the equity, equality doesn't mean equity. And when we start doing this work, it's important for people to understand the difference so that we can all recognize that there's gonna be some, uh, uh, there's going to have to be some specific strategies that are cultural and community specific before we can um, move forward. So yeah. So the second thing is uh, we have to engage and empower affected populations and their stakeholders. So on this slide, uh, you know, I just this is the equation for me. There might be other people that look at this stuff differently, but I look at engagement plus empowerment as equaling equity, right? So if I engage your community, that means, hey, I ask you a couple of questions and maybe I ask you to do a survey, you know what I'm saying? Maybe I handed you a flyer or whatever, but that doesn't mean that that does anything to transform your reality, right? I might have surveyed you and doing research and then I'm out. But if I empower you, that means that I, I, I provided the resources for you, the knowledge and information to you that will allow you to actually transform your world, right, and your reality. And then when we put the engagement and the empowerment together, that's when we're developing equitable situations. Because I, if I engage you and say, hey, man, what is it that you need in order to transform the fact that you don't have access to healthy food? And then I come with the monies and I come with the tools and the soil and the wood and all the things that you need in order to create this garden or this farm, or maybe you wanna do something else. Maybe you wanna do a commercial kitchen. If I provide those resources after I've engaged you, now I'm dealing with equity. I'm, I'm meeting you where you're at. And you know, I'm basically trying to get the hell out of the way. You know, in our reality, at the bottom line, that's what it's really all about. It's like, how do, how do, or how do we as community create opportunities for community to solve its own problems, right? You know, engage might mean only, might only mean somebody getting input, but how do I encourage community ownership and decision-making and community design of the solution?
that's really what the what equity work is all about. So uh, here, um, okay, I'm scaring. My, are y'all seeing my chat stuff? I'm sorry. Are y'all just seeing my screen of the video? Oh, it doesn't matter. Um, I was trying to see the chat. So if there's any questions, just you know, say something as we go. Um, so uh, the third step is to gather and analyze the data, but data is not all created equal right so i can get a bunch of information right i get a bunch of data points a bunch of you know map information and census data and statistics and all this type of stuff and it could be all in one but if i don't disaggregate it if i don't break that data apart right and look at it based off of specific indicators it really might not make any sense it's like oh well we just know it's really bad like specifically how bad is it and who is it bad for? That's really what I mean when we say we need to disaggregate the data. But data, I fell in love. Hannah, yo, GIS has been a godsend. Like, I swear to God, like when I first started doing this work, I used to, my eyes used to gloss over when somebody was doing the data reports and all this type of stuff. And I'd be like, oh my God, I'm sleepy because you're talking this stuff and I don't know what you're talking about. But now, after I've gotten into this work, I'm like, yo, what's up? Let me, let, how do I get into the GS, GIS? How do I see the maps? What, give me all the different maps of the different indicators so that I can overlay them, right? And when I overlay them, it comes, the overlaying of these maps tells a more powerful story than any one map alone. Yes. And that's the most <laughs> that you all had to understand is like, I can see, if I see this map, this is a map of, food access in the city of Richmond, right? This is according to USDA. The green is where the food access is, right? So um, I'm looking at this map, and as you can see in the West End, Cary Street Road, River Road, West Huguenot Road, West Broad Street, none of those places are really dealing with, um, uh, dealing with lack of access to healthy food. But at Eastern Highland Park, Creighton Road, down South Side, Bell Boulevard, Warwick, Hall Street, Melothian Turnpike, they are. And it's intense, right? And so when, you know, somebody says, okay, well, I go on Cary Street and there's four grocery stores in Cary Street. I'm like, damn, you can put one? And you got four on Cary Street? You can put one in all of South Side? You can put one in all of the East End? We had to like damn near fight, you know, the community to get the market at 25th. It was literally like years and years of battling until a philanthropist said, yo, I got the money to waste. I mean, I'm not sorry. I'm sorry. Not waste. I have the money to blow <laughs> on this. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'm just going to leave that there for now. Uh, I got the money to put up on this. Uh, <laughs> that's a whole nother conversation. I think we might have time for that later. Uh, so, Anyway, this is the map, this is data, and it's disaggregated, you know, uh, I'll show you another map in a few seconds so you can see. But um, this is an, another thing to, to look at. Step four is when we're talking about this work of racial equity, it's important to have a systems analysis, right? Because what, what, what happens when we talk about food access a lot of times? People devolve into this, it's an individual choice shit, which is so oppressive because it wasn't like it was an individual choice for a community to be realized. Like this is a system that was put in place. And so if one or two people can crawl out of the cracks and get wealthy enough to, or can, you know, become vegan and have a, a, a wonderful health, healthy outcome, you know, that still doesn't absolve the fact that we have a system that has created limited access to healthy food for hundreds of thousands of people in the city, right? And this is not just Richmond. That's, a, that's another thing to have to point out. Like people think, think it's just their locality. Bro, when you get out of just Richmond and you look at the data from all the major cities, this is the same, it, this shit is fucking, uh, excuse my language, it is just, ah, it's, exactly the same okay so when we talk about 
figuring out how to what to do about this, you had to start asking questions, right? And so th these are several questions that I like to ask that it sounds like that, that really gets you some really interesting uh, answers. So what are the racial inequities, barriers, or negative outcomes involved in the problem being examined? Who is burdened the most and who benefits the most? That's the question. That's a question that you should ask. Like, who benefits the most from folks not having access to healthy food? And this is not a conspiracy theory question. This is just like, well, who gets paid? Because there's no, there's no, there's, there's no access to uh, fresh food and vegetables, right? Um, what are the key causes or contributing factors that's making this an issue? What are so what solutions or interventions could el eliminate the inequities, right? What strategies could result in systemic change and advance equitable solutions? What are what social conditions or determinants contributed to the problem? You know, what institutions are involved? What what policies or practices are involved? This is the type of stuff that you have to start looking at to get to root causes of why this stuff is a problem. I have a friend that uh, talks about the baby in the bathwater. So in this hypothetical world, it's a very macabre world where there's some very malicious person, evil person that's at the top of a river. There's a village downstream and the people live in the village. And apparently there's people at the high end of the river upstream that are throwing babies in the in the river, right? Like they throw the babies in the river and then there's somebody at the other end downstream that's like, yo, there's babies in the river. And they go and, you know, get the baby out of the river, right? So these people getting the babies out of the river. Uh, that's the nonprofit uh, industrial complex. Like people just going to get the babies out of the river, right? But rarely do people stop and ask, who the fuck is throwing babies in the river, right? Why, who, how we stop the babies getting thrown in the river in the first place, right? So that's, that's the type of conversation we have. How do we, how do we stop the person that's throwing the babies in the river is the work of getting to the root cause of the issue, right? Okay, so I'm gonna go on. Um, so back to the data, uh, you know, when we're doing these systems analysis, you know, using the data, we can start to analyze what's going on. And as you can see, this is the redlining map, right? Also overlaid in this map, these dots, these are vacant properties in the city of Richmond, right? So as you can see, the concentrations of all of the vacancy in terms of uh, lots and homes are concentrated in the east end, north side, and in the south side. Right. So when we start to look at the root causes of why these inequities exist, then we can start to unpack what are some potential solutions that we can utilize in order to affect change. Um, when we start to think about racially equitable solutions, uh, the questions become even more targeted because that's when we start identifying the strategies and targeting the resources to address the root causes. You did, you know. So the questions I might ask is how will the solution address the root cause and affect systemic change? You know, who can be an ally or supporter of this work, right? Uh, how can those most adversely affected by the issue be actively involved in solving? In fact, I don't even think that's the question. I think the real question is uh, how can those most adversely affected by the issue own the solution? come up with the solution and implement the solution, right? That's really, you know, getting to the root cause. So, you know, in this work, one of the most important uh, two words for me is working with community, you know, uh, and that's where all this stuff about authenticity and transparency and honesty and inclusivity comes in because if you are going to work with community, you got to show up with, you know what I mean, your full self. You can't be faking the funk, pretending like you're going to do this. You can't have ulterior motives and all this stuff. People see through that and it'll chew you alive and spit you out. And you look like, you know, nobody don't really want to work with you. And then honestly, it's actually bad 
because what happens is people come into community and they leave bad taste in people's mouths and makes it harder to organize in those communities after folks have left and you know uh gotten tired of organizing in those communities it's crazy it's not. so yeah so that's step five and then steps uh we we'll get to step six in a second but this is my um uh, this is a, a slide i just tossed in there uh uh, this is my theory of change in terms of local food systems. Um, I'm focused on how to get people paid. Okay, so the acronym paid production, aggregation, innovation, and distribution. Right? These are inter interdependent and synergistic. Right? If I'm doing food systems work, I can't just do production and not think about distribution. I can't just do distribution and not think about aggregation. I can't do aggregation and not think about how to create a product, right? So all these things are interchangeable and well, interlinked. There's not, it's not in, in any particular order, but it just sounds dope when I say I'm trying to get people paid, right? So production, aggregation, innovation, distribution, that's, those are the functional parts of a healthy food system, you know, that we can overlay into communities and work with people in, developing different elements of these uh of these systems of this of a system and everybody can play a part right it's not you know somebody might be growing somebody might be aggregating somebody might be creating a product and somebody might be distributing right so at all times there's always a role for people to play uh let's see um oh step six yeah so this is a never-ending cycle right we continuously evaluate the effectiveness and adapt the strategy. This is the work, right? We implement the strategy, we track the results, we assess the pro progress, and we revise the strategy, right? So what's interesting at this point, like in terms of the work with Jenner Urban Gardeners, we're at the revise the strategy stage. Because <laughs> all right, there's no Lewis Ginner. So now we got to revise the strategy that we had at first, and we're going to come up with, and we're in a state of implementing a newer strategy and we'll be tracking the results and see how that works we'll assess the process the progress and then we'll revise it again it'll always iterate itself and that's what this work has been over the last well to be honest over this over the last eight to nine years really it's just a cons consistent evolution of the work from one form into another as we refine it um we eat the elephant one bite at a time Right. Everybody um, uh, likes to, you know, we get lauded for the work that we did, have been doing. But this, to be honest, like this is a long, we've been biting, we've been chewing at this thing for a while. Right. So what you're experiencing as a part of this movement and this part of the work is like it took years to get to this, to really realize like what pieces will be necessary to really uh, uh, take the community to a higher, higher, higher plateau. So um, let me see, one more thing, last one. Um, barriers to equity in the food system. Um, this is just my personal uh, understanding. Uh, racism is one of the biggest uh, barriers to equity in the food system. I will tell you personally, I've been doing this work for years before I got to Lewis Ginter and nobody wanted to fund anything that we were talking about. And if they did, they gave us a little bit of money, right? But when I got to Lewis Ginner, all of a sudden, like everybody wanted to have a meeting, everybody's open, you know, the, the funding doors were kicked wide open. And it's because I'm at this white institution with all this money and all this prestige. And I was saying the same exact thing that I was saying before I got to Lewis Ginner, but I was saying it at Lewis Ginner, and now all of a sudden we were able to get all the money, right? So racism is the one is one of the most important, one of the biggest obstacles for communities to do this work. The second thing is silo thinking. You know, people, organizations operating in silos, not collaborating, not figuring out ways to cooperate, com actually competing against each other for funding and resources, which is asinine because really there is so much money in the philanthropic world, but we are getting we get pit, we get pitched this narrative of lack by philanthropy because of the grant process or what have you man i seen at lewis ginner bro i seen 
when I first got there, somebody pledged seven million dollars to anonymously to uh, redo the conservatory. Seven million anonymously, right? They didn't even want their name on it. They said that if Lewis Ginner can raise seven million, they will get the seven million. So I'm sitting there like, yo, I used to think like I was getting $5,000 and that I got some money. I was like, yo, I got five Gs. Oh, I was going on. We do a little dance, man. We're like, yo, we're going out to eat. We're going to drink. We got five Gs in the grant. I got to Lewis Ginn and was like, man, five Gs won't shit. <laughs> it was nothing. <laughs> it was literally nothing. But we did a lot with five Gs. Not to say that it's not nothing. I'm just saying that in comparison to what, you know, money really looked like you know we was blindfolded we was food and then third um you know just evolving in silo thinking like also beyond just collaboration cooperation like people not really thinking about systems right and how systems operate that's one of the biggest challenges is like having when we're doing this work helping people to understand that we live within systems right and irrespective of how woke you might be you still live within a system, right? There's a political system, there's class systems, there's racist systems, there's systems all around us. And no matter how, you know, above it you might feel, you know, we are, inter you're interactive with these systems. And unless we take the time to change the systems, then, you know, you'll be bounced around, no matter how you, how you might feel about it. Uh, the third thing for a, bar uh, a third barrier, is a lack of traditional, lack of non-traditional access to capital. And when I think about non-traditional access to capital, I'm talking like no interest loans. You know what I mean? I'm talking about like, I don't need to see the credit score for you. Like we believe in the work and maybe there's some alternative ways to assess your uh, trustworthiness or whatever. Uh, I'm talking about like uh, the grant, with all without all the stipulations like a ten thousand dollar grant just to do the work without like it being 25 pages long right um talking about um using tax credits to fund working community conservation easements etc you know there's a lot of different non there's a lot of different ways that we can access capital and trying to figure out ways to, to do that so that communities can get paid, you know, pay for service bonds, right? Through city government, right? It's just wild it's how many different things that we could do to get funding to do stuff that we just don't know, we just haven't been at, uh, uh, introduced to. And then uh, the, the, the fourth barrier is a lack of true community engagement. When I say community engage, true community engagement, I mean like, yo, I'm going into this room and i'm gonna listen you know what i'm saying i'm listening first i'm not in here to try to tell you what i got and all the information i got i want to hear your story and i want to hear how we can work together to address these issues a lot of these organizations say they do community engagement and it's not it's just basically marketing they basically got they take they change the name from marketing department to community engagement right so they put the brand out in the community, you know, they do a couple focus groups or what have you. It's not really like I'm here to walk with you to address the systemic inequity. And that's really like, if you know, you know, you can ask Randy or anybody that we've been doing this work with, that's the, that's the narrative of the community engagement program at Lewis Ginn. At least when I came on deck, that's what we walked with. It's like we were, we're here to walk with community to figure out solutions to these problems and the resources that we put in community were designed to build resiliency for those communities so you know i ain't saying we did it better than anybody i'm just saying that we did it in a way that's really designed to be uh, to, to help people recognize that you know inclusivity is of the utmost importance if communities of color are not in the room then start over right go talk to the most important person in the neighborhood and become their friend not for the sake of you having a job but because you really give a fuck you know what i mean like i'm really i'm here to meet you because i'm here because i have access to resources and i really want to see things get better and i'm here to walk with you 
And in many instances, and in most actually instances, I'm here to follow your lead. I'm not the here. I'm not here to save you. I'm here to be the one. I'm here to be like, yo, what do you need me to do? And a lot of times, people don't know how to do that. You know what I'm saying? That's that's an ego check that is so hard for folks, especially in these nonprofit spaces, because people have an emotional connection to being the leader a lot of times, and they have an emotional connection to being to having answers or feeling like they have answers, right? But it's different. It's, it's difficult to go into a community with all the answers if you haven't listened. And it's impossible actually to go into a community and do anything if you think that you know everything already, because this type of work is an exchange. I'm learning from you. You're learning from me. In fact, you know, only reason why you know we got it set up like this is because there's technical information that's necessary for you guys to learn. So we provide technical experts and they have a field of scientific information and knowledge that we're here to share. But in community, you know, as we go through, it's like nobody care if you got a PhD or if you studied under whoever, whatever. It's like, yo, who are you? And are you a good person? You know, uh, you have a sense of humor. Can you laugh at yourself? <laughs> so yeah, you know, anyway, that's all that stuff. Um so yeah, that's the that's the talk. Uh I wish I had another one, but I can't find it. I was in a rush. So basically, I just want to share that as we do this kind of work, the whole conversation about food justice, really man, when we define food justice, uh, there's a long technical definition that includes, you know, is the food uh that's being grown safe? for people? Is it safe uh, for human consumption? Is it safe uh, for the animals on the planet? You know, and there's, and then there's issues of like people getting paid equitably, you know, farm workers, like are they getting paid uh, a, a fair and a fair wage? Uh, really at the core, it's about figuring out ways that people can have ownership of, the, of their food system. Um, when we talk about access, you know, one element of it uh, is it culturally relevant. Uh, when we talk about food justice, that taps into a world of food sovereignty. Have I, do I have control over what food that I have in my community and how it's been grown? You know what I mean? Like, am, uh, or am I relegated to someone else growing it for me in a way that I might not deem safe or relevant to my cultural identity? Yeah. Um, so when we think, talk about, think about the difference between food access and food justice, anybody can provide access to healthy food, but it is, 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 is the food being uh, produced in a way that is just, or does the community have ownership over the means of production, aggregation, innovation, and distribution? Are the community, uh, communities in question the ones that actually Getting, getting the money. Man, you talk about the grocery store. Let's take it back there. If a grocery store opens up in the neighborhood, does the community own the grocery store? The community owning the grocery store is food justice. Somebody coming and opening a grocery store in the community is food access. Which is, be which is better? In my opinion, the community owning the grocery store is more important than fucking Kroger, Food Lion, Walmart, Aldi's, Publix, any of these corporate entities coming into our neighborhoods and extracting the monies from the community. We don't really think about it like that, though, right? So who owns Publix? Publix is not a nonprofit organization, right? And when it hit the fan, are the people at Publix getting paid what they're worth right now? You know what I mean? They're out there on the front line you know, with a sneeze guard in between themselves and people with potential pandemic diseases, but they're getting paid $10, $10 $12 an hour. Like, come on, man, that's not correct. This is, this is not the way that it's supposed to go. So when we think about the justice part, we also have to think about like communities being discriminated against, being locked out of the food system. So black farmers, you know, minority farmers, Indigenous farmers, 
you know, treaties being broken by the U.S. government, you know, people being forced onto reservation, you know, not being uh, 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 